Good morning. Um, this is always the best time change because if anyone's going to get it wrong, they show up an hour and a half early instead of an hour and a half late. So, um, Marge, I'm not going to tell anybody what time you showed up this morning, okay? <laughs> um, wonderful to see you all here. Uh, the altar over here warms my heart to see so many loved ones um, placed on the altar being remembered. Uh, I want to give again give thanks to Wendy Bevier for putting this altar together altar together for us this year. Um, it also warms my heart to see so many people here uh, to honor those that we've lost over this last year. I know this is always a, um, it's a tough service, but honestly, um, we do it together, and that's the big part of this is that there is a group of us here in this room. We are a community, and we are here to lift each other up and to support each other especially in those moments of remembering those that we've lost. So I hope you all can see the love that is present because we are all here together because of all of you. So uh, thank you. A couple announcements before we get started. Um, after saying that kind of heavy part, actually, let's just stand up real quick and say hi to each other. Hi, Kevin. I see you. Everybody say hi to Kevin, too. He's up there. <laughs> A couple announcements before we get started. Um, one, today we are packing once again for the, the brown bag breakfasts. All of the supplies have been laid out, so it is just a really sim simple uh, conveyor belt kind of a situation. Walk in. The bags are ready. Please help us pack for vulnerable seniors in Buellton. Um, Next announcement is two Sundays from today, we will be having our annual congregational meeting. This is the one where we vote on budget as well as people who have been nominated for positions. Um, it's typically the one we want as many people as possible to come to, so we're going to bribe you. Uh, we will be providing breakfast during that uh, meeting, so please come. Uh, we're gonna have some extraordinary stuff, quiches, casseroles, bagels, the works. Um, so, so come please and, and join us for our congregational meeting. We will only be having one service that day. It's going to be the 930 service uh, and then the congregational meeting will be happening right after that. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's information in your bulletin about the rummage sale that's coming up on November 23rd. Uh, detailed information about when you can drop stuff off, so please, please read your bulletin about the rummage sale. We always need help with the rummage sale, too. It takes a lot of work to put that thing together in a matter of a few days and to clean it up right away. And I'm totally going to use this card. Livia is six months pregnant, um, so seven months pregnant. I'm not pregnant. I just want her to have a lot of help. So if you can help out with the rummage sale, please talk to her as well. That is all we have for announcements today. It's wonderful to see you all. Yep. I didn't even read the list. and I'm sitting here holding it. Uh, today is the last produce table day. So, and there's a good amount of stuff here. Um, today we have butternut squash, green bell peppers, tomatoes, bread and butter pickles, boysenberry freezer jam. There's some roses, uh, red delicious apples, fresh eggs, tangerines, and celery. Um, so please go check out the produce table, donate what you want, take what you want. If you have been operating on credit, please pay up or we're going to come after you. Um, and check it out. Thank you, everybody. Let us take a moment to prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Please be seated. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, healer of our every ill, source of unending mercy. Amen. Embraced in enduring grace and good hope, let us turn again to God, confessing the truth about ourselves. Merciful God, we come before you, beloved but broken. We have not always treated others as we would want them to treat us. We have not always called out injustice and abuse. We have not always been kind to ourselves. We have not always taken care of the world we share with other living creatures. Remind us of who we are, beloved children, in your love. Renew us by your spirit to live as your holy people, bringing healing around us. Amen. At every moment, you are held in existence by the love of God, renewed by the Spirit within and among you, and made alive again in Christ. Receive this assurance in Jesus' name. You are forgiven and freed to live for the healing of the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy God, giver of blessing to hungry and hated, overturner of ordered tables of friendship and enmity, teach us a new way of being beyond regard, beyond revenge, that we may do to others as we would have them do to us. Through Jesus Christ, who prays for all who crucify him. A reading from the book of Daniel. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head as he lay in bed. Then he wrote down the dream. I, Daniel, saw in my vision by night the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was troubled within me, and the visions of my head terrified me. I approached one of the attendants to ask him the truth concerning all this. So he said that he would disclose to me the interpretation of the matter. As for these four great beasts, four kings shall arise out of the earth, but the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. The word of the Lord. Today's responsive reading is from Psalm 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel be glad in its maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with the tambourine and lyre. For the pleasure in his people, he adorns the humble with victory. Let the faithful exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their couches. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and the two-edged swords in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with fetters and their nobles with chains of iron, to execute them on them the judgment decreed. This is glory for all his faithful ones. Praise the Lord. Today's second reading is from Ephesians. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, 
might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord. Let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
invite you to stand as you are able for the gospel. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Then Jesus looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. My dearest siblings, grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen. Um, this has been uh, it's been exceptionally rough two weeks um, for our valley. Uh, after tomorrow, I will have done four funerals in ten days. Um, two of those are are longtime beloved members of our church. Um, the other two are beloved uh, parents of um, people. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have heard of the, the car accident that happened on 154. Uh, Vanessa Blay and her two children were struck and killed um, by a guy who was trying to end his life. And uh, shortly after that, one of uh, the high school freshman students um, died from opioid. It's been a rough week. It's been a rough week to hold all of that as well, to try to hold on to the pain that, that our collective valley is experiencing. And right in the midst of all of that, here we come and gather for our All Saints Sunday, the time of the year where we honor all of our loved ones who have passed away over this last year. And I have been with most of you during that time too. And I can still remember so viscerally the pain and the grief that accompanies losing a loved one. Um, it's been a tough week. And here we gather as united beloved children of Christ, coming to mourn and lift up and comfort one another. When I think about what Christianity has offered to people during these times in their lives over the years, um, I really feel that, that Christianity is both a blessing and a curse. Um, to me, it seems like a curse because it's been misconstrued. Christianity has been treated as this way to uh, skip over grief, a way to look at a person who has lost someone they've loved and say, well, they're in a better place, or you're going to see them again one day. It's one of those ways that I think we as human beings have concocted so that we don't have to sit in grief. We could just try to move past it as, as quickly as possible. It's become our fix-it solution to the pain that accompanies the inevitable loss of, of life, as well as the inevitable, inevitable love that comes with that life throughout knowing those people. But then there's the blessing of Christianity too and especially for us as Lutherans, that is the cross. That is that we believe and affirm a God who went to the cross and died. It is that we find our support at the feet of that very cross. 
The comfort for me as a pastor isn't so much in the aspect of the afterlife, the heaven that happens next, but more in the God who suffers with us, the God who is present with us in our grief and our pain. And and because we try to move past that grief so quickly, we forget about the cross. We forget about this poor Palestinian Jewish guy who reached out to the vulnerable, who lifted up those in need, and ultimately who died for the world. A God who promises to be with us in all of those moments of pain and sorrow and grief in our lives. It's hard to put into words what this looks like, and so I'm not going to try to do that with my own words today. Um, I'm going to read something to you all. This is a letter that Max Gleason wrote. Max is the husband of Vanessa Blay and the father of the two children who died. This is a man who lost everything. And I've been thinking since hearing about this and talking to friends of of, um, Vanessa, what could this guy possibly be going through and, and, and what could he possibly have to say of substance in a time like this. And so I'm just simply going to read this to you. And I do want to warn you, um, it's raw. This is Max Gleason writing. As I think of those words, my name, Max Gleason, I do not know what they mean anymore. Once the ego is recognized at a young age, maybe three or four years old, we spend the rest of our lives creating meaning around the name, creating what we think is an identity. I remember as a child, I think I was four, when I had the realization that everyone else in the world has a life, has a story, and that the world was happening outside of me, not just in me. I have held that memory of realization Now at 39 years old, I do not remember the actual memory, just the remembering of the memory, because I have held it with me over the years as part of my story, my identity, Max Gleason. All we are really when we think of our identities is just a collection of memories. Thousands or millions of memories stuck in a brain that is what people are mostly. And most of those memories are just photographs The real memories, the non-photographed memories, fade very quickly. There is essence to life. There is essence to identity, but it is so rarely glimpsed in our day-to-day routines. Our world is constructed and we generally operate on a collection of memories, be they short-term and easily discarded or long-term and necessary to retain our identities as we move through life. So rare do we touch the essence of ourselves or the people around us. It happens through love, through touch, through the, through the ecstatic climax of sex, or through the touch of my child. Essence, life essence. So profound, yet so rarely felt. I am scared for my memories and therefore my identity. The love of my life, Vanessa Blay and our two children, Lucienne Blay Gleason and Desmond Blay Gleason were murdered. I am still alive. All I have of them now are memories. I am so scared that those memories are going to fade. They will be replaced by photographs and words. Their essence will no longer be available to me. I am so sad about that. It is the worst sorrow in this universe. My identity has been gutted and now I have the long, difficult task of creating a new identity. The thought of that is so unknown and terrifying. My family was murdered. Their death was not some senseless random act, but a deliberate act of evil. Evil exists in the world. It inhabited John Roderick Dungan, and he deliberately ran into my wife's car in an attempt to kill himself and kill others. He succeeded in the latter, but not the former. He is still alive. My family is dead. There is evil all over in this world. We hear about it every day in the news. It is the dark force. But there is also a light force that exists as a counterpoint to the darkness. 
Reading about Taoism and Buddhism, and especially the often amusing ramblings of Alan Watts, have significantly helped me in my understanding of the big ego questions. Who are we? Why are we? Where did we come from? Where are we going? As Taoism explains, there cannot be light without dark. There cannot be love without evil. There would be no appreciation of love without evil because we need the counterpoint with which to compare love to. Otherwise, it has no meaning, no definition. In thinking about the death of Vanessa, Lou, and Des, I am finding some small solace in the thought that their light collectively was so strong that it required such strong evil to extinguish their light. Theirs was not blowing out a candle with a breath, it was dumping a bucket of water on a wildfire. It needed something so strong, so violent, in order to counterbalance and honor the light that they were in this world. I have only realized this fact this morning. This is four days after they died. I felt the extinguishing of their light so profoundly, so acutely that first night. And every day since, it comes in waves, some more intense, others milder. But I am realizing the full intensity of their light now with the people that are still here. The amount of feeling in the world right now for my dead babies is unreal. People are loving and hurting all across the world. The messages keep coming in and from people I have never even met or knew existed. Vanessa touched so many people. Her life force was so large that people are coming out of nowhere and feeling this loss. And they are not just sorry for me. Apparently, people are feeling this pain. I am trying to understand this. I'm trying to understand how so many people could give a shit. And the only way I understand it in my rational mind is that this is archetypal. The symbol of a young mother and her two babies being killed is so primal. It so cuts to the core of what we are as human beings. It cuts to the core of our biology because we are animals trying to breed and survive and pass on our DNA. That is evolution. That is why all mothers protect their young at whatever cost. It cuts to the core of our culture. All cultures are based on family, which extends to tribe, which extends to cities, states, nationalities, but the root of all culture is the family. When a family is killed, the culture feels it. It cuts to the core of our spirit. This is the real archetype. What is spirit? No one can describe it, but almost everyone feels it. It is why we have religion. It is why we write books to try to understand. We don't understand, but we feel it. That is why we keep doing any of this, because we feel the spiritual undercurrent in life. The rational brain does not do it. Rationally, there is no reason to keep making babies, working, eating, dying, and repeating this process over and over and over again. It does not make sense. So why do we do it? We do it because we feel the spiritual undercurrent in life. We know, not rationally, but intuitively, that there is something larger at play, that we are part of a divine process. That is the essence. That essence that is only glimpsed through love, through the touch of my child's hand, through fully joining with someone in the climax of sex, That is the essence of life and the essence of identity. If I can say anything to anyone at this time, it is to be in that essence. Feel it. Stop moving around. Stop all your busy work. Live in the essence. Touch the people that you love. Hold quiet space with them. Feel them. That is all we have. It is all you have right now. It is all you will ever have. That is the whole point to anything. How do you hold on to so much pain in the world? How do you survive it? How do you survive losing someone or anyone, people, children, that you love so much? There's no answer to that. The only answer is what you have sitting with you right here in this room right now. 
For those of you that are here mourning the loss of someone you loved over this last year, you have a community of people sitting in this room who love you, who are here for you, and who will always be here for you. You have memories of those that you've lost that live on inside of you that will never go away. You are who you are because of the collective love that has shaped you, and that never goes away either. Please stand as you are able. Steve Patterson. Carol Burtness. Bill and Myra Peterson. (laughs) 
Agnesen. Teddy Steyer. Maria Olivier Gomez. Helen Nielsen. Hans Knudsen. Howard Peterson. Tony Bell. Jens Berkholm. David Eck. Gordon Labarge. That's okay. Hans Berkholm. <laughs> Barbara Klassen.
Barbara Boyd. Hank Simonson. And those whom are not named, who our world still grieves and loves. These lights are representations of the lights, the essence that burns in all of us and through all of us, and those lights never go out. A reading from Psalm 42. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night while men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you. And let us pray. Even in our grief and our mourning, we thank you for calling us to this adventure of faith. You have made us in your image to respond to your grace. Your story came alive with the children of Israel, of Leah and Rachel, of Zilpah and Bilhah. And a promise was born that one day no face would be forgotten, no body enslaved, no spirit broken but all would join the covenant of life. You sent your son in solidarity with us, healing our sickness and confronting our demons. He bore the cross and rose again to disclose our true humanity. Therefore, with all your unlikely saints, with the church of many times and languages, with those who have known you under different names, we sing the glorious liberty of all the children of God.
In the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus was celebrating the Passover feast. During that meal, he took a loaf of bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to those gathered with him, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took a cup of wine, and again he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Take and drink. This cup is a new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. We remember Jesus in the bread, the wine, and the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the Lord is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We will be celebrating communion this morning by intinction here in front of the chancel. That means that our ushers will invite you forward to come and receive a wafer. Please dip that wafer into the large cup, which contains wine or the smaller cup, which contains grape juice. We do have gluten-free wafers available for anybody who would like them. For anybody who's not able to come up and take communion, please just let the ushers know. We'll be very happy to bring it to you. For all of our guests who are with us today, we do celebrate an open communion table here at Bethania, which means we welcome everybody to participate in the Lord's Supper. In bread broken and wine poured out, we find a God who is with us in our moments of sorrow and our grief. A God who says, I will love you and be with you always. Come and be comforted. For me, this is the body of Christ and blood of Christ, both for you. given for you. Renata, the body of Christ, given for you.
united with the saints of every time and place, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Almighty God, in your love and forgiveness, you call us your saints. Direct us now in your way of servanthood so that the whole world will know your unending love. Lord, in your mercy. Life-giving God, you shower your creation with blessings of abundance. Sustain us with your blessing so that we never cease to protect and find joy in your creation. Lord, in your mercy. God of all nations, you raise up leaders to govern the nations. Give us clear vision and a spirit of wisdom in the upcoming election and empower the newly elected to work for justice and harmony. Lord, in your mercy. Compassionate God, you look upon the lowly and call them blessed. Bless the poor, the hungry, and those who suffer persecution. Comfort those who mourn, those having to make hard decisions, those who are lonely and all who are in need, especially the family and loved ones of Myra Peterson and Edna Roberts. We also pray for those who serve our country, both at home and abroad, as well as those we name in our hearts and out loud. We pray also for Glenn Jacobson, Tim Reed, and Karen Johnson. Lord, in your mercy. Rejoicing in hope, we lift our prayers to you, most gracious Lord, trusting that you have received them in your care. Amen. Please stand as you are able. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.